Good evening. Please come in. Please take your seats. If you enjoy music, please move closer to the stage. And now you may stop talking. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday night plenary. Uh, my name is Jeff Speck, and uh, I convinced a famous musician who just happens to be a friend of mine to perform at CNU. And I told Lynn Richards, that gets me 10 minutes of your time. And she said, how about five minutes? And we compromised at seven. So I have seven minutes to talk about anything I want. Um, so first of all, welcome to the best event in CNU. Yes. Uh, you can tell me later if I was right, but I think I am right about this. And so what can I, oh, and so these are my seven minutes to speak to you. So first of all, have you seen that there's this thing where people who look like people in art go to the museum and dress up like the painting? So there's that, right? Cool. Uh, what else can we talk about? Um, who, who experienced the tent fiasco last night? That was hilarious. Okay. Oh yeah, there's, there's my book. Let's talk about my book. But what I want to, actually one thing I do want to mention to you, and I have a, I have a, I have a reading for you. But, um, you know, a lot of people have told me that the book has been very useful to them, but they go to hearings and stuff and they hold it up, and it just isn't enough of a tool. And so I do want to announce um, that I'm coming out with a new book in the fall. Um, what if Walkable City had a lot more pictures and a lot of instructions and a lot of new information and was actually a new book um, that you could use to get work done. Geared not towards general readership like Walkable City was, but geared towards us doing our work in the field. And that is the book that's coming out next year. And I wanted to uh, do a little reading from it, but it's actually coming out in this year. It's coming out in, in October. Um, but I want to do a little reading from it, not to give you a taste of the book, which is organized as a series of rules, 101 rules, where each one kind of has a name and a subtitle, um, and actually a rule at the end, for example, restripe streets with wide lanes to a 10-foot standard, et cetera, et cetera, um, boiled down to 101 rules. But I wanted to give you a reading from the book because actually there was a, I had 101 rules and I got rid of one of them because there was something that was, been, that was very much on my mind that I wanted to talk about in the book that was new. It's Rule 87 now. And Rule 87, which has nothing to do with tonight's panel, is called Don't Let Terrorists Design Your City. And Rule 87 goes like this. I, here I put on my like dramatic reader voice. The scene is devastating. A terrorist plows a pickup truck down a Manhattan bike path, killing eight people and injuring almost a dozen more. The public demands a government response, and Mayor de Blasio rises to the occasion, immediately budgeting $50 million for new vehicle barriers around the city, including funding for, a, for 1,500 steel bollards costing $30,000 apiece. While people are still on edge, this commitment is largely met with approval and a feeling that our leaders are working to keep us safe. But there remains in the air a general sense that something is amiss. While it's hard to think rationally about terrorism, a cool-headed analysis of the terror threat in our cities leads to some difficult conclusions that could dramatically impact our policies and practices. One, a bloody death is a bloody death. Somehow, when a death is intentional and an accident, sorry, when, somehow when a death is intentional, and an accident is instead a murder, preventing its recurrence becomes inordinately worthy of public funding, especially if the perpetrators are brown. But those who have personally witnessed a fatal car crash will confirm that the anguish, trauma, and tragic repercussions are no less than what accompanies any other violent death. A rational public safety policy would treat all lives as equal. Remarkably, taxpayers invested less than $22,000 per victim to put an end to the 186 car crash deaths on Queens Boulevard. And just to interrupt myself, you may be aware of this, that 186 people died um, on Queens Boulevard 
between, well, basically in the last 25 years until 2014, and they fixed it for, for, um, for I think, $4 million. And now no one's died on that road since. So, remarkably, taxpayers invested less than 22000 per victim to put an end to the car crash deaths on Queens Boulevard, while so far allocating approximately $1.7 billion per victim, as Joe Minicozzi would say, do the math, $1.7 billion per victim to avenge 9-11. This discrepancy deserves our attention. Two, terrorism is statistically insignificant. There are different ways to do the math, but an objective accounting of several decades of data suggests that you are 568 times less likely to die in a terror attack than in a car crash. Fewer people were killed in the New York truck attack than have died in traffic practically every two weeks before and since. A proper epidemiological approach to public health and safety would allocate resources proportionally to the dangers that they address. Three, there is always a soft target. It is impossible to harden an entire city. This fact is perhaps the greatest source of cognitive dissonance surrounding New York's Bollard campaign. For every bike path and sidewalk newly protected, there will remain hundreds exposed. If all public spaces receive Bollards, an impossibility, a terrorist need only take an AR-15 to a hotel room window. In this way, we are doomed to be always protecting against the last attack instead of the next and misspending millions on what is effectively security theater. Oh, I forgot my picture. Security theater. The anti-terrorist the anti landscape is terrifying. The purpose of terrorism is not principally to hurt people, but to cause panic and to unravel the social fabric. In that regard, a built environment that loudly proclaims the expectation of attack is in itself a form of terrorism, inciting fear, uncertainty, and suspicion in one's fellow man. Just like subway stop and frisks and a constant barrage of see something, say something messages, explicitly hardened public spaces are best understood as artifacts of a complicit terror industrial complex that prohibits, that, sorry, that profits by keeping us scared. The fact that most actors in this drama are well-meaning should not distract us from resisting its grip. Next, bollards can be nice. In Cities for People, the Danish planner Jan Gale, heard of him, notes how most people enjoying Siena's Piazza del Campo choose to linger near the large stone bollards that surround the space. Bollards are traditional street furniture and if designed well need not participate in a terrorist threat that they may be naively responding to. If de Blasio's bollards are attractive, well-crafted, and well-located, they can become po a positive feature of the spaces that they inhabit, rather than a permanent emblem of our panic, concrete evidence that the terrorists are winning. But they are still money wasted. Public safety dollars can be spent in a way that has a real impact. With limited investment, child traffic deaths in, in the Netherlands went from more than 400 in 1971 to just 14 in 2010. A small fraction of our current anti-terror budgets transferred to road safety would save thousands of lives. And then we end with the, the rule, right? Every, every rule ends with the rule. Resist the compulsion to throw money away on anti-terror infrastructure, speaking honestly about risk, effectiveness, and proven paths to better public safety. Redirect funding accordingly to street redesign. And I challenge the CNU to back me on this because it's, it's a political hot potato. Yes, please clap if you agree. <laughs> okay. So, now to the main event. Imagine this conversation. Hi, I go from medium-sized town to medium-sized town. I stand up in front of medium-sized crowds. I give them a show and I make their lives better. Oh, so you're a city planner? No, I'm a folk musician. But I did write a town planning book, and a darn good book it is. Um, I'm introducing Dar Williams first because uh, Candy Smith is speaking first, and I want to introduce her just before she speaks. And a darn good book it is. To riff on my blurb for that book, to become a great city planner takes three things. Strong powers of observation the ability to communicate, and the opportunity to travel the world to learn from successes and failures. Anyone who has heard a Dar Williams song is familiar with her gifts in the first two categories. And what better vocation 
than wandering minstrel to get to know the wide world and all its places. So observant, so articulate, and so prepared, Miss Williams just needs an internship at DPZ to become a leader in our field. Now, we're delighted to have two rock stars with us tonight. Um, and the other is, is Kennedy Smith, who I've known for many, many years and was delighted to see on this program as well. Um, Kennedy spent 14 years as director of the National Trust's legendary Main Street program, which is legendary because of Kennedy. Um, during those 14 years, she expanded the program into more than 2,000 communities, generating more than $18 billion in investment and almost a quarter million new jobs. So I used to oversee the Your Town program at the NEA, and we hosted four, four workshops a year in different communities. And it was my job often to invite the experts to those. And the only thing I didn't like about the program is that I couldn't bring the exact same experts to every community, because we had to share the wealth, right? But Kennedy is the person that if I could have, I would have brought to every single town, because really, um, she is without equal. So without further ado, let me introduce Kennedy Smith. So tall, my God. <clears throat> so this is what happens when you don't get your suggestion for the title of your presentation in on time. You get sessions that are named things like economic development in small and middle-sized cities. Um, hopefully it'll be a little more interesting than that. I, I actually, I started out uh, intending to be an architect. I went to architecture school, but then um, I got drawn to the numbers side of things and it happened for really two very specific reasons or places. The first. Um, was that I had gone to graduate school at University of Virginia, and um, just a few years before I arrived there, uh, Charlottesville had hired Lawrence Halperin to do this uh, pedestrian mall downtown, which, um, you know, nice though it might be, especially now at the time, almost immediately killed 35 downtown businesses because the trade area went from 50,000 people driving along Main Street every day to the 5,000 people who worked there. So there just wasn't enough market. That just, my head was spinning from that, wondering what on earth had happened to downtown Charlottesville. Um, the second was this business from my hometown. Um, on the eastern shore of Maryland, Watson's Smokehouse. Uh, I'd probably been there for 100 years by the time I was in junior high school. Um, and uh, it was a little slit of a building, maybe 15 feet wide. Um, you walk in and you kind of like have to kind of hug the wall because this big tobacco bar extends back and then behind that there's a soda fountain. Um, but if you look at the, at the detail, look in the left hand window and you'll see the Fab Four. Watson's was like the place in town to buy albums, to buy records when they came out. So everybody would hightail it there after, after high school and um, go to Watson's and have a chocolate zip and listen to the new records, which they would play for you, whatever you wanted. Um, then this happened, um, a new enclosed suburban regional shopping center, shopping mall was built um, a few miles away from the downtown. There it is, beautiful thing. Um, and Watson's moved out to the shopping mall after 100 years of being downtown, and it was gone within, within a year. Um, it had died. And I could not believe what was happening to this downtown. It was just sort of unraveling uh, before my eyes with changes and businesses coming and going, and I wanted to know why. So. Um, midway through architecture school, I sort of decided, you know what, I think I want to pay attention to what's going on with downtowns. Um, these guys came along, lots more downtown businesses closed, um, and I started paying attention to what was happening. Now, what was happening basically is we, we were building more retail space than we had retail dollars to support. Um, four square feet per capita in 1960, 41.6 square feet in 2016. You often hear the number 28 out there in the press. That's because that's how many shopping center and shopping mall square feet there are. They're not including um, freestanding and downtown space. Um, we have enough market demand to support not quite half of the space that we have. So we have a lot of redundant retail space, and that's why downtowns um, suffered. Um, this is what happened to downtown business composition. Um, if you make this axis, which I use a lot, on the up and down axis you have all the different kinds of things you can buy in the world, and on the uh, horizontal axis, you have the price points at which you can buy them. Um, shopping malls, which specialize in apparel, took that apparel piece out, sort of middle income households, apparel, that was the piece that disappeared from downtowns. So department stores, clothing stores, jewelers, things like that. 
big box stores take kind of this piece out of the market. Um, I couldn't make it really follow the contours in PowerPoint, but you get the, get the point. Um, and you can see the overlap there with shopping malls, and that's the reason that so many regional shopping malls, which, as I said, specialize in apparel, um, have been suffering over the years, leaving this big chain of uh, vacancies in older downtowns and out on the highway strips um, around communities of all sizes, um, and creating this just awful looking mess out there. Um, if I didn't tell you this were Lynchburg, Virginia, you probably wouldn't know. You might have thought that it was Lawrence, Kansas, or that it was Frederick, Maryland, or that it was Gulfport, Mississippi, or that it was Rollins, Wyoming, or that it was Joplin, Missouri, because they all look exactly alike, and they look I exactly bad. Um, this morning, I went out in Savannah, and I photographed some uh, businesses. Can you tell me which of these is in Savannah? The one on the top is in Savannah. The other one is in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Um, which of these is in Savannah? The top one is, and the bottom one is in Harrisonburg, Virginia. You wouldn't know. They look exactly the same. I photoshopped out the name of the business and the logo. Do you know what it is? What is it? How about this one? How about that one? It is scary. It's scary. Um, basically, corporations are scattering their, their logos. Um, up and down our, our, uh, our highways. Um, of course, the Salisbury Mall that killed my hometown downtown has itself now died and is being demolished, is demolished and has been a vacant field for um, quite a long time now. Um, and that sort of sequence, that's what fascinated me and got me involved in downtown revitalization, which is in small and mid-sized cities is basically the same thing as economic development in those communities because that is what, what kind of runs the shows. Um, Dar Williams was, is a very bright woman. She, you know, she's been to a thousand towns and uh, she decided to like pay attention to what she was seeing in them. When I started working for the National Main Street Center, I knew I was going to be traveling around. I've been to a close to 2,000 towns now. Um, and did I think about, oh, I should like codify my thoughts about this? No, I thought, hey, everywhere I go, I'm gonna have a Manhattan and, and you know, write a book about it. Um, so I did, I wrote a book about Manhattans uh, after I'd sampled about 1,000 around the country. Uh, chapter one is the history of Manhattan. Chapter two is uh, profiles of 10 great bartenders and their recipes. Chapter three is a list of places where you can get pretty good ones in each state. Uh, and chapter four is instructions on how to, and how to tie the cherry stem in a knot with your tongue when you're finished. So if I were to write this book, I probably should call it what I found in the thousand towns in which I sampled a Manhattan. Um, and that's what I'm gonna kind of talk about tonight. So I have found a lot of really stupid, dumb stuff in places I've traveled to. Um, like, you know, businesses that aren't quite paying attention to their customers' needs. Um, we, we call these occupied vacancies. Um, businesses that aren't, you know, exactly, don't give you that friendly welcome when you come in. Um, communities that are clearly not quite paying attention to business placement and uh, synergy that you create on the streets. Um, uh, places that maybe don't see the buildings. I'm not sure what's going on there, but they, uh, this one I really like. Did they not notice that big historic bank behind the little um, tiny branch they built there? Um, and of course, lots of places that when they just got tired and thought, okay, all of this vacancy must be the fault of the buildings, let's tear the buildings down, instead of realizing that those historic buildings are exactly what gave the community a sense of place um, and uniqueness in the marketplace. Um, fortunately, there are lots and lots of great things happening out there now in uh, downtowns and communities of all sizes, but I see a lot of energy, particularly in small and mid-sized communities. Uh, businesses that are kind of getting it and are learning that they can market through uh, additional channels. Um, people who are investing in their buildings, um, people who are coming back into the districts and having a great time with new businesses um, setting up. Um, one of the things I've, I've learned over the years is that uh, on this kind of chart where you have a uh, on the one, one axis, places that know nothing about how to get things done, and then on the other extreme, places that know a lot about how to get things done. Then there's the other axis of, of places uh, with tons of barriers, political, financial, whatever, and then places with no barriers. And small towns tend to fall in that upper right quadrant. They don't know a lot about how to get things done, but they have no barriers, and they don't know that they can't do some of the things that they do, and therefore they do them, and amazing things happen, whereas cities often get um, bogged down um, and uh, log jam with their plans and don't move us forward. So there's a lot of great innovative stuff that happens in small towns. Something else I learned in my uh, years with the Main Street Center and my years since is that um, small towns and big cities really don't want to learn from each other. 
Um, the small towns don't think that big cities have anything to offer them. The big cities are like, we cannot possibly learn anything from a small town. Um, and in reality, many of the solutions are exactly the same. They just have to kind of be presented in a different way. Um, so speaking of books, you know, this book came out a few years ago, Food Rules, excellent book by Michael Pollan. And now there's a bunch of, of rules books, uh, Emily Taylor's City Rules, Jeff's upcoming book, Walkable City Rules, which, by the way, to get this um, high-res image for the, for the um, um, PowerPoint, I emailed his publisher who says, uh, uh, great, put it in, and by the way, if you tell people that if they order it, pre-order it from Island Press and say numeral four spec, they'll give you a 20% discount, so go do that. Um, and I have a book coming out, too, with my partner called Revitalization Rules. Um, it'll be out in, in uh, July. Um, and it has 52 rules, one for each week, sort of like a meditation, a meditation on what to do. Um, and I'm going to go through 15 of them tonight. Uh, the first is don't develop more retail than the community can support. I mean, that seems kind of obvious, but I see so many vacant um, brand new shopping centers um, scattered around uh, the strips out there that it's that's kind of scary. Actually choose to improve. Actually choose to improve the community. And I say this, um, it sounds obvious, but you have no idea how many communities I go into where everyone seems really committed to revitalizing the downtown, and yet they are still building all this new redundant superfluous stuff um, out on the highway strip. And not really paying a lot of attention to what it looks like, so that it's looking like every other town in the country versus something that carries on a local design tradition um, and would be truly uh, indicative, uh, unique to that community. Um, I, you know, I used, I was at the National Trust for 19 years, 14 of them as director of the Main Street Center, and, you know, historic districts are kind of a big thing in the preservation world. It has never made sense to me why it is that we like take all this care to protect a historic downtown and make it harder to develop there because of that. There are other like, you know hoops you have to jump through, but we seem not to care what happens outside the downtown. You have to drive through crap to get to the beautiful place. We should actually be flipping that, making downtowns the easiest place to develop, um, and really pay attention to the design of the, of the uh, outlying space, um, repairing, repairing uh, spaces. Uh, build a complete economic ecosystem. Um, a lot of small town downtowns get really hung up on having enough parking. Um, and uh, which, for, which is kind of crazy for a bunch of reasons, but um, if they had enough people living and working in the downtown to support the number of businesses they would need to fill up the storefronts they have, they wouldn't need that many visitors and therefore wouldn't be very car dependent at all. Um, and it, in that, in that uh, uh, rubric, it's especially important to cultivate small industries. Small industry used to be a huge part of downtown economies. Um, but for a lot of reasons, retail has kind of like leapt to the forefront. I think it's because we've had a generation or two that have grown up with shopping malls and think that that's what downtown should therefore be, that we think that downtown ground floor space and upper floor space needs to be like all retail. Um, retail is in bad shape. Loans from 314, losses from 314 loans secured by failing shopping malls totaled 1.68 billion from January to November of 2016. The average US household owns 300,000 things. Only 3% of all the children in the world live in the US, but they own 40% of all the world's toys and books. The average American will spend 3,680 hours looking for misplaced phones, keys, and sunglasses, and other items over the course of his or her lifetime. That equals 153 days, almost half a year. The average American home has increased almost threefold in size since 1950, but the average household size has declined from uh, about 3.5, 3.37 to 2.58 people over that period of time. Bigger houses, fewer people, more stuff. In spite of our bigger homes, 10% of American households rent off-site storage space. Off-site storage is the fastest growing segment of the commercial real estate industry. We have 7.3 square feet of off-site storage space per capita in the US. The average American woman owns 30 outfits. In 1930, she had nine. Americans throw away an average of 68 pounds of clothes each annually. There are more TVs in the, in the, uh, than people in the US. We have more shopping centers than high schools. Um, personal consumption has skyrocketed and now accounts for uh, two thirds of, our, of, of um, 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 our economy. That is a very, very weak foundation. We spend $1.2 trillion annually on non-essential things. What are non-essential things? Things like marshmallow puffs, you know? Um, that's 11.2% of total commercial spending. 
1950, non-essential spending accounted for only 4% of, of consumer spending. We just have too much stuff. We have too many retail stores. I'm probably like the weirdest retail market analyst in the world to say we have too much retail. We need to do something different. We spend more on jewelry and shoes than on higher education. 40% of American households have no savings. So let's not pack our downtowns with retail. Let's, let's work with the retail we have. Let's develop some to fill in gaps. But let's think about bringing jobs into downtowns. One of the things that um, my partner and I have been doing for the past, I don't know, five or six years is looking at old uh, Sanborn fire insurance maps um, and looking at uh, the downtowns of small and mid-sized cities in their heyday when they were really performing at peak performance, economic performance, usually in the 1940s, uh, early 1950s, and just doing a tally of what kinds of businesses were there. Um, what do you think the percentage was, what percentage of all downtown businesses at their peak do you think were, of all downtown businesses, were, were retail businesses? Yeah, I mean, everything, 40, 50, 17%. 17% of downtown businesses at their peak were retail businesses. The rest were personal professional services, um, a lot of small manufacturers of different kinds, wholesalers, entertainment, lots of other activities. Um, so we need to bring that kind of business back. And this is popping up. You're seeing it in, you know, co-working spaces that are making tech things and maker spaces. But, uh, you know, even just like basic things, like here's a guy who does shoe dyeing. Here's a, a heating and HVAC uh, plumbing place. Um, a carpenter who makes uh, custom furniture in downtown Cuero, Texas. Um, porcelain and crystal repair. Um, those, those, basic, those basic kinds of, of manufacturers we need to get back in our downtowns. And uh, no surprise to anybody in this room, many communities um, uh, zoning laws prohibit that kind of business from locating there. I've got horror stories I could tell you about all night long about uh, businesses that have been kicked out of downtowns or fined for staying um, because they have a manufacturing uh, bent when they're not really manufacturing anything at all. We need to develop and not recruit new businesses. There's this myth out there that you can go out and recruit businesses for a downtown. That's hilarious. Um, places like Williams Sonoma, The Gap, The Big Guys, when they come to a downtown when the downtown is hot, they come there when it's already established and you have numbers that you can show them and prove to them this is a great downtown to be in. Otherwise, they're not, they're not gonna give you the time of day. Um, it's really important to develop the locally owned businesses that then get the attention of the big guys and at which point you don't even want them to come in, um, but to uh, instead work with entrepreneurs to, uh, to develop them. I love this one, this is, I just saw it a time too long ago. It's uh, in Cooperstown, New York. They, uh, uh, the town selectman passed a law saying no food trucks, you know, in the town. So this guy opened a restaurant called Food Truck. <laughs> it's, it's like tiny, tiny. You go inside and it's set up like a food truck. It's really the coolest thing. Um, so what do you need to develop a business? You need a, somebody creative with a creative idea for the business, a great idea, and then you need somebody with money. And um, unfortunately, the creative people usually don't have the money. So um, you, need to put those, you need to put those two people together. Find, find the entrepreneurs um, and find the sources of capital, which is, you know, fortunately, a lot easier now that we can do crowdfunding. The Americans Job, American Jobs Act um, was passed, you know, a few years ago, and the regs went into place two years ago. And so now people in communities can invest between you know, $1,000 and $10,000, depending on their net worth and their annual income, in locally owned businesses. So you can actually put together the funding that you need um, to support businesses. Even before the Jobs Act, people were, were crowdfunding online on different platforms. This is a, a Kickstarter campaign for a bakery in uh, California. Um, had a goal of uh, $20,000. They raised $21,000 um, within their time limit. Um, and use the money, basically, what you got for your money were the naming rights to menu items. So you could have a muffin named after you, or, you know, a cookie. Um, if we, like, jump across the Atlantic for a second, um, they they've, they've, they, they um, um, have lots more experience with crowdfunding in the UK than we do in the US, and so if you look at some of the UK crowdfunding platforms like Crowdcube, I particularly like, you'll see all kinds of downtown businesses. The US so far has funded mostly tech businesses, but there are lots of just bread and butter kind of downtown businesses. This is one um, called the, uh, the Village Haberdashery, and it's just a, it's a haberdasher in a downtown. Um, that's beginning to get rolling more and more here. 
Um, and there are, are various hybrids of this. This is a group in Port Washington, Wisconsin that put together their own crowdfunded investment group, uh, basically to buy a couple of downtown buildings that were um, being threatened with demolition, um, rehab them, redevelop them, redevelop a plot of land that was vacant between them, um, and put the businesses in place that they wanted. So they opened a cafe. This is a rendering of the new building that they are now, now under, that is, is now under construction. There's a rendering of what the view will be. It's called Harbor Lights. Um, all done with local capital because people are investing in something that they can tangibly see and touch um, and experience and they're going to support um, as customers. Um, I'm seeing more and more accelerators, business accelerators popping into uh, downtowns, even of small, of, of, of small towns. This is the Brandry, this is in Ohio. Um, basically combining co-working space, mentorship, training, uh, and investment capital. Um, and if a business uh, takes off that's started there, 7% of their equity goes back to the, uh, to the, incub to the um, um, accelerator to support its, its operations. Um, this one is a, is a great one. And of course, these are all, they locate in older buildings. They like to be in walkable places. They like to be in older downtowns. It's important to understand the market and really uh, do the research and talk to people to make sure you're getting it right. This is a, one of my favorite, like, God, I can't believe this is really happening stories. This is a town in Michigan, we'll go nameless to protect them, that um, uh, did some market research, figured out they, they could support some new restaurants. The people um, involved in the Main Street organization really wanted a nice upscale white tablecloth restaurant, so they went out and got some guy to open this French restaurant. Um, he was in Detroit and he opened a, um, an outpost there. It was open for about six months. Its customers were the members of the Main Street organization, um, which was not enough to support it. It was uh, closed. Uh, he sold it to a guy who turned it into a barbecue mud wrestling place that is a screaming success. So um, there was demand for a restaurant. They were not reading the market quite right. So be sure to understand the market as you uh, are looking at business development in downtowns. Um, and of course, business development for downtown businesses for independents can be global now. There are businesses that sell stuff from um, storefronts all over the all over the country and all over the world. This is a guy in Rising Sun, Indiana, who makes concert harps. Um, he's right in the downtown. Everybody in Rising Sun who needed a concert harp has bought one by now. Uh, there's not much local market demand. Um, they find him online, and it is fabulous to have him there because you hear this harp music as you're walking down the sidewalk, and you were just drawn to it. It's like heaven. Um, this is a, a woman in a, a western Kansas, tiny, tiny little town, who had a um, a quilt shop. She sold quilt supplies, and the town is shrinking. It's losing people. It's one of these, you know, communities that's depopulating, and so she was making less and less in sales. So her son, who had like, you know, was sort of a tech guy, had this idea. He says, "Why don't you put together a design your own quilt website where people can like design their own quilts, and then you farm out the commissions to your customers who will then continue to buy fabric from you?" So she did it, and it was like this enormous success with orders coming in from all over the world. Um, she, it was so successful that within a year she had sold her business to a big tech company online for a couple million bucks um, and now operates a hobby business, one of those occupied vacancies we complain about, but you know, so it goes. This is a guy who makes weather vanes, you know, from a downtown in Massachusetts. A lot of this stuff is happening all over the place. Uh, next rule, head off gentrification. Um, it happens in downtowns just like it happens in neighborhoods um, that you can uh, out, out price um, businesses that have been there for a while. And there are plenty of things that can be done, like um, selling retail condominiums so that businesses can uh, buy their space um, before the rents get too high. Special um, programs and protections for um, historic businesses, heritage businesses, legacy businesses that have been in the community for a while and mean something to the community because uh, they play an important part of its history. Um, and many more things like that. Get everyone, everyone involved. Um, I go to so many meetings, charrettes, wherever, where you look around the room and you say, you know, everyone here kind of looks like me, and that's not everyone in the community. It's really important to reach out and get everybody involved um, so that you uh, can make sure that you're, you're actually um, getting the barbecue mud wrestling place and not the white tablecloth at restaurant uh, down. Um, and you know, there are lots of things we can do besides inviting people to charrettes. Candy Chang does all these cool things where she puts stickers out and people can say what they want to have in a, a vacant building and slap it on the window. Um, lots of outreach things we can do through um, schools, through um, churches and temples um, to, uh, to um, reach more people. And build partnerships between those 
people. This is something I suspect Dar will talk about, about how you know, in smaller communities, you can have somebody can have an idea and build a little team to make it work. Um, and sometimes uh, we can be the ones to see what those partnerships might bring and put the people together. Um, I think that there is, uh, we assume that designers design and designers do design, but the design process I have found is actually a great tool for solving all kinds of problems. If you sort of think about how could I solve this problem in a community without actually designing or building something, how would I use the skills I have to make that, to make that change? Um, so I think that we are actually, people in this room are in a great position to build those partnerships in creative ways to make things happen in communities. Work incrementally. This stuff, you know, especially in small communities, it does not happen overnight. It doesn't happen during the term of a mayor's term of office. It doesn't happen during the life of a comprehensive plan. Um, it takes time. This is a, one of my favorite, like, incremental success stories. This is Burlington, Iowa. Anybody know Burlington? It's on the Mississippi. Um, beautiful place. It was built to be a town of 60,000 people, and now it has 27, 26,000. Um, so it is a lot smaller than it was originally built uh, to be. So it has large buildings. Their sort of epiphany came about 30 years ago, 25 or 30 years ago. They were trying to tear this building down on the waterfront called the Port of Burlington building. Um, but it was, you know, built, the, the, the foundation was built by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it would take, like, some major, major explosives to get rid of this concrete thing. So they realized, ah, maybe we should keep the building and we'll use it for something interesting. So they uh, turned it into a visitor's center and a made in Iowa store um, and public space. And that kind of got them rolling and they started thinking about how can they reuse all their buildings and how can they do things with them. There was a bakery, a commercial bakery downtown that um, was thinking about uh, uh, demolishing these buildings. This is an old historic mill. Um, and they wanted to demolish it because the alley behind it, which led to their back door, their loading dock, wasn't quite wide enough for the 18-wheelers that were coming down there. Um, so the new Main Street organization said to the Chamber of Commerce, which owned the buildings, was about to give them to the bakery for demolition, what's it going to cost you to demolish the buildings? And he said, I don't know, you know, 10,000 bucks. And they said, okay, give us the $10,000 and the buildings. We'll rehab the buildings. We'll move the bakery um, someplace else and, and um, um, tear down this, this um, little concrete block building to make the access to the bakery work. So they did that. They used the 10,000 bucks to rehab the first building. They sold it with protective covenants, bought the second building, rolled that over again, bought the third building, and began to sort of bankroll a progression of rehabbing buildings throughout the downtown. They had a pedestrian mall, much like uh, my hometown, Salisbury, had had, um, which was causing big problems for them. They took it out, um, allowed themselves plenty of room for wide sidewalks for uh, dining and activities. Um, and began slowly building new businesses, figuring out that the way to turn this downtown around was to develop enough business activity that there was enough rent coming into the buildings that the property owners could afford to maintain them and periodically rehab them. So, you know, 300 businesses later, um, they began to tackle some pretty big buildings. This is a, um, uh, uh, they call it their heritage inn. What they do is, uh, as they were rehabbing buildings, they would, they would recycle building materials, and this is kind of their storage facility for them. Um, they then tackled their, their first big building was the Hotel Burlington. Um, been vacant for several years. The first two floors uh, had completely deteriorated and were full of dead pigeons. Um, they uh, spent several years working on that, turned it into ground floor offices and upper floor uh, apartments. Um, they eventually tackled the rehabilitation of the Capitol Theater. It was an $11 million project, uh, including uh, buying the building next door and turning it into um, rehearsal space and workshop uh, uh, space, uh, costume facilities. Um, and they've just now tackled this one. This is one of their first uh, eyesores that they had. This was a vacant J.C. Penney that had moved out to the uh, regional mall and closed. Um, they have now, a local developer has uh, bought it and rehabbed the building um, and turned it into a brew pub which uh, was inaugurated uh, just this past winter with a, uh, a keg roll down the street to uh, get everything going. Um, and they're now taking on the Rasmussen Building, which is a beautiful um, National Register building. And the historic Tama Building, which they're turning into uh, apartments and condos overlooking the Mississippi River. They have a fabulous bike race every year uh, that goes up Snake Alley, which is, which is the curviest street in the world, not that, that imposter in San Francisco. Um, and the bikes race up the, uh, up the curvy street. Um, but over the course of their 30 years, 29 years, they've uh, opened 333 new businesses and had businesses expand, 680 building rehab projects, 400 new apartments and condos, 92 million in private investment, and 14 million um, underway right now. Slow and steady wins the race. 
Um, speaking of slow and steady wins the race, this is what we found to be the sort of the pattern in uh, successfully revitalizing downtowns for years. Um, along the bottom axis here, I have the years of activity. And no matter what the, what the investor um, is that you're measuring, the investment uh, metric, whether it's jobs created, net businesses, or dollars invested in private and public sector investment, it kind of follows this curve, which kind of makes things go into three phases. There's a catalyst phase when the revitalization activity gets going, um, and they don't really have a track record to sell, so the community is sort of raising money you know, with a hope and a dream that things are going to uh, gain traction. Um, then when they do gain traction, you begin to see uh, investment taking place in uh, a, a second phase, which we call the growth phase, and then finally it levels off after a period of time into a management phase where you're maintaining the positive uh, changes in investment that's happened. Um, and one of the keys to funding re ongoing revitalization activity is as um, economic activity is picking up in the district, so you've got um, properties worth more, uh, property owners are generating more in rents, businesses are selling more, uh, the community is collecting more in property taxes, um, is to funnel a little piece of that off and route it back into the ongoing administration of the program. So that's how you kind of put the steam into <coughs> a revitalization program. Another great incremental success story, this is in Lanesboro, Minnesota, which decided you know, not quite out of the blue, but kind of out of the blue in 1987 that it wanted to uh, create a theater downtown. At that point, almost every building downtown was for sale for under $10,000. It was a, a dead downtown. Um, and uh, they decided they were gonna build a theater. So they asked these guys to put together a theater group and they were like, oh, okay, I guess we will. And they started doing some local performances, repertory performances, um, and it snowballed and it snowballed and it snowballed into this amazing uh, theater, the Commonweal, which opened up in uh, 2007, finally, after several years. Here was their, their process. They made the decision in 1989 to go with this. Uh, in 1991, they launched a student matinee program. In 92, a two-week-long immersive training program for high school students. In 93, they began rotating their repertory season so they could reach more, more visitors. Um, in 95, they started a, a radio company so they could broadcast their plays. In 96, touring productions, 97, an elder care collaboration. 98 in Ibsen Festival, which is a big deal for them now. Then a new play series, an artist residence program, um, and they finally were able to raise enough money to open the theater. And it has transformed the community. It is a different downtown now. Um, they have they have haiku, like farm-related haiku on their on their light posts. I love this. Corn staring at stars, soybeans sitting in the sun, wheat in the soil. Um, and all kinds of art galleries and restaurants have opened up to support this little industry. This one I love too. They have a phone booth where you dial a number and you hear a story that one of the, uh, the resident playwrights has, has written for them. Um, it's also important to work strategically, so incrementally, comprehensively, strategically. And a great example of this is the Playhouse District in downtown Pasadena. Everybody knows Old Town Pasadena. The Playhouse District is kind of at the end of it, and it's the home of the Playhouse Theater. Um, when they started, like, thinking about why isn't the economy of the Playhouse District taking off about 15 years ago, what they realized was that even though they had several theaters in the district and several art galleries and they had a Cordon Bleu cooking, cooking school, all that artistic activity was bottled up in those buildings and you didn't see evidence of it on the streets. So you could go through there and you would have no idea that you were in a place where a lot of exciting stuff was happening. And they, they began honing in on, let's get the arts out out into the public realm in a big way. They started with crosswalks that they decorated using motifs from the um, uh, the Asia Pacific Museum. Um, they uh, hired artists to uh, do wraparounds for their uh, electrical box. I'm, I'm, I'm switching boxes. This was the first series. Then they went to sort of a First Amendment thing. There's the Main Street manager standing with one of the uh, one of the uh, wraparounds. Uh, big table, a long table event to showcase uh, cuisine available in the district. Um, an art walk with it's actually kind of an art role, I guess, but um, a, li a, um, a literary fest. Um, they began having uh, some of the theaters actually do productions outdoors, um, an art district festival, plenty of photo ops, things for the kids to do. And this one, they're, they're a, um, a program called High Neighbor, um, where they basically are inviting people who live right there in the neighborhood to come into the stores for demonstrations, for free wine and crackers. Um, here's a photography workshop that they do, uh, making people who live in the Playhouse District really feel engaged in the arts in a good way. Very, very focused on let's get this arts message out there. There's even a church in the neighborhood that decided they were going to get left behind if they didn't jump on the bag wagon. So they got these solar lights and um, uh, wrapped them with uh, some tape and made this installation on the front lawn of the church where it kind of points, the arrows gradually point towards the entrance of the church, sort of illuminating the way. 
Create your own tools. Um, you know, I hear people complain all the time about, oh, you know, this program's being cut by the feds and the state is turning back the budget for this. Create your own tools. There are plenty of communities doing financing tools out there to make things happen. And in the business development realm, it's things like this is a cafe that needed a new uh, cappuccino machine. It was going to cost it 10,000 bucks. They were cash strapped. They charge up their credit cards. So they thought, what can we do? Their profit margin on cappuccino was really, really high. So what they did was just before the holidays, the Christmas winter holidays, they offered $100 gift cards for sale for $50. So people would buy them and they were getting 50 bucks of product free, basically. But it only cost the, the shop about $20 to provide that $100 um, of products. So they were still making 30 bucks. They pre-sold them quickly enough to get the cappuccino maker and the whole thing um, uh, rolled out from there. Um, some communities are doing forgivable loan programs for business development for high priority businesses. Waterville, Maine has one where they will loan um, a qualified business $50,000. They have to be on their hit list of their top priority businesses they're looking for. They have to agree to be open 48 hours a week to change their window display every you know couple of weeks um, and various things that uh, you don't usually see written into leases uh, in downtowns. Um, and over the course of five years, uh, the business pays interest only and 20% of its uh, principal is knocked off every year. Um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina has a fabulous program that I've uh, used in a lot of communities around the country um, for, uh, for um, high startup cost, uh, um, 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 capital intensive businesses. Uh, this one was for restaurants. Uh, they call it the Restaurant Row Program. They had a block of derelict buildings on the edge of the downtown that they wanted to uh, get better activated, and they thought that putting a group of six to eight restaurants there would help turn the corner for it, so to speak. So they went to established restaurateurs, asked if they would consider opening a second restaurant here. They wanted to make sure they had people actually had restaurant skills. Um, a couple of local banks offered to provide 70% of the financing needed. The restaurateurs had to come up with the other 30% on their own. The city then used some of its block grant money, could have been any kind of money, but they used block grant money to basically pay the, the debt service for the first two years for those restaurants. It wasn't a gift, they had to pay it back at the end of the 10 year loan term, but it gave the restaurateurs two years of breathing room financially to uh, pay off their equipment and their, their um, um, furnishings and build a clientele. Worked just brilliantly. Um, we need to animate storefronts and streetscapes, and I know we, we're hearing about some of this in the conference, so I'm going to focus mostly on storefront windows. If you've got vacancies in a downtown, you can make them not look vacant by doing fun things in them. They are basically little stageettes where you can uh, have activity happen. Um, this is a, um, a theater event taking place. This is a, you know how realtors tend to like, their window display idea is taking all these like eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper and just taping them to the inside of the window. That drives me like batshit crazy, I hate that. So um, these guys, I love this, they soldered together some of these like, you know, picture frames, you know, digital picture frames um, with photos of buildings sort of rotating through them. And these are actually motion activated. If you wave your hand in front of one, it'll then go to a description of the building so you can read it. Simple, simple thing to do. Um, a little humor in storefront windows, this is a, a used, uh, clothing store uh, in Massachusetts called Boomerangs um, with a really witty uh, window uh, display designer. This is uh, in the spring they had had wedding dresses on display. Now it's the end of wedding season at the end of summer and so the wedding gifts left over are half off. <laughs> half down the mannequins. Um, here's an optometrist who's put blinkies in the window so as you walk down the street you see all these eyes blinking at you as your perspective changes. This is um, a vacant storefront window that was used as a promo for this men's clothing um, store. And what they've done is they've filmed a, a guy doing these leaps and jumps, um, wearing the clothes they're trying to promote against a green screen, and they have a heat sensor on the outside of the window. There's a scrim right behind the storefront window, um, and they have a rear projector just like this. We could do it in this room if we wanted to. Um, and when somebody walks by, it responds to uh, the motion of the person on the street. Um, some people, you know, walk by it and don't even notice it. Some people walk by it and nearly have a heart attack. Um, <laughs> it's really fun. Let's, let's do it, you know. Um, there's the guy being photographed on the green screen, and there's the whole setup. Simple, simple thing to do. There is so much that we can do with electronics now, with Arduino and uh, to make things happen. This is another, this is a fun one. This was actually is a neighborhood in London where they used um, snow makers and uh, an Arduino board um, and a, um, uh, Twilio API to make this thing called Make Rivington Street S uh, Snow. They put five snow cannons on top of buildings, and um, there they are soldering up the Arduino board and attaching it to the snow makers. And then they had these signs that said, dial this number, and you can make Rivington Street S S Snow. So you dial it, it sets off the snow cannons, and people were making a white Christmas for themselves 
uh, even though there was no white Christmas. Lots and lots of possibility to animate storefronts and streetscapes um, and get people paying attention. The most important rule of all is believing that you'll succeed. And um, I have, you know, I have been, I've worked with so many communities that have great possibilities, that have meager possibilities. The ones that succeed are always the ones that believe they will do so, because when they believe that, they can do anything. Um, and that's the important message to take away. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, Kennedy's been a CNU member since the beginning, um, and she and other CNU members, and I should say CNU-like thinkers at the National Trust have really changed the conversation around preservation in this country. And I remember, probably many of you remember, that maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, they would send out a list every year of the most endangered buildings, right, in the U.S. And now, for some time, they've sent out a list of the most endangered places with the understanding that, that the real role of buildings is contributing, as, as we CNU members know, um, to framing the spaces uh, between them. So thank you, Kennedy, for that. Um, so Kennedy, a little fun fact, went to college at Bryn Mawr, um, which I mentioned because the school's unofficial but now beloved anthem was written by Dar Williams. Instead of a PowerPoint, she packs a Martin although tonight it's a Collings guitar. The New Yorker calls her one of America's best singer-songwriters. I call her one of the most poetic urban planners you will ever meet. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dar Williams. guessing that a lot of you come from places with waterways and waterfronts that you love and value. So this is a song from, from my river to yours. This is called The Hudson. If we're lucky, we feel our lives, knowing the next scene arrives. So often we start in the middle and work our way out. Go to some gray sky diner for eggs and toast, the New York Times or the New York Post. Then we take a ride through the valley of the shadow of doubt. But even for us, New There's a time in every day The river takes our breath away And the Hudson Holds the life We thought we did it on our own The river roads collect the toes for the passage of our souls through silent silver woods, green flowers and snow. And past the George Washington Bridge, that from the trails of Breakneck Ridge, the river's ancient path is sacred and slow. And as it swings through every shade of blue into the city of a new brand new and the Hassan holds the life we thought we did it on our own I thought
take hold the mountain range in the autumn cold and I thought West Point was Camelot in the spring if you're lucky you find something that collects you helps you feel your life protects you cradles you and connects you to everything this whole life I read They never turn me into someone else And I say, yeah How's the life? We thought we did it on our own And I say, yeah How's the life? So we did it on our own. Oh, 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 Well, thank you so much. That song has a lot to do with uh, how we feel connected and, uh, you know, what connects us. And people talk a lot about what connects us, and, and they talk about community. And, um, and that word always kind of scares me because when, you know, I, I've done a lot of work with the environment, and I go to festivals, and they talk about permaculture. I have a neighbor who told me about something called transitional communities, and she's like, okay, so people get together, and they talk about growing all their own food, creating all their own you know, renewable power, and they even talk about their water sources in case there's some apocalyptic event. And I'm like, that's a shame spiral for me. I, I can't even imagine you know, that level of organization and and. and and it seems to sort of suggest, I don't know, a lot of getting to know one another and spending a lot of time and involuntary potlucks and hugging. And so, uh, you know, so that's one thing. But then there's this other narrative that comes together when we say community. People go, we're just so divided. We're just so divided. I mean, if we could just put aside our differences, really work together, you know, just get something done. We're just so divided. <sighs> Okay, so that is, an, that is also, uh, to me, problematic. What I'm really interested in is not just how we are, in this macro way, going to be not divided. I want to understand what happened in Staunton, Wisconsin, when they decided not to tear down this building that was a combination town hall and opera house and retain it and, and re renovate it and create an incredibly successful building of, of public-private, you know, partnerships. So, you know, how did that happen? Because some towns really figure that out, some towns don't. And um, my, my guess started to be, because people were talking to me about this in the audiences after shows, there's this festival called Sittenmay. Okay, so tell me how to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Sittenmay. It is the Norwegian founding day in the middle of May. Uh, in Staunton, Wisconsin, and everybody knows about it. This is a festival that has, for very young kids, a troll painting contest. There's a 5K run, there's a 10K run. There's also a l plenty of local high cholesterol food. So we're already looking at some sort of diversity and local uh, brews, you know. And then there's a, um, there are a lot of rehearsals for dance and music um, and a lot of meetings for that, for, for the presentation of all of this Norwegian dance and music. And then there's a respect for the elders, and that goes on through the year, the people who feel represented in, in this Norwegian background. And so I imagined, I thought, okay, I think that's what saved the building. 
all these people knew each other. You had these kids painting, you know, and they didn't have to be Norwegian, obviously. They're just painting trolls, and, and you've got people who are interested in fitness, and they're running, and, you've got, and then you've got these sort of elders and all of these high rehearsal, high communication activities that get everybody talking. So that when someone says, don't you want us to rip down that gorgeous old building and, and build a nice flat cement structure, uh, farther out from the downtown, they say, no, no, we want that building, and we will do all sorts of things. They found this guy. They had so much what we call social capital that there was a guy who said, uh, yeah, I really would like to do a lot of the renovations of that theater to create that turn-of-the-century feel, um, and it is gorgeous. This is a guy who was kind of on the outskirts, did his own thing, built his own plane, um, then wanted to take it out, realized uh, that he couldn't get it out of his building, had to rebuild the doors to get out the plane. Those are what we call loners. And, and he chose to come in and put in all of this time. He was feeling that. So I call that thing where we have all of those different kinds of connections and relationships and also the ethos of feeling connected. I call it positive proximity. Positive proximity is just that basic experience where you sense that living side by side with people who are different than you are uh, is good, has a lot of potential, has something to explore. Robert Putnam from uh, Harvard, a sociologist from um, Harvard that I was pointed to, um, he calls, he's he has this thing called bridging social capital. Social capital is this bank account of goodwill and, and trust and a sense of, you know, this as opposed to this. And bridging social capital is the most exciting kind because, you know, bonds happen, bonding social capital, you have your congregation, your club, your affiliation, the thing that you know, uh, and you bond within those things. Bridging is when your congregation gets, you know, has a barbecue with another congregation that's completely different, uh, different religion, different, you know, different kinds of relationships, bridges. Um, happen. I got really excited about that thanks to communities like Staunton, Wisconsin that did things that, you know, Kennedy was talking about that are so impressive. E windows displays, uh, you know, s different kinds of festivals, different kinds of pop-up stores. Um, I just loved that. And, and so I thought of positive proximity as sort of, you know, this, this bridging social capital as, as these sort of interwoven vines. And things like the Sit and May Festival became the trellis on which these vines could grow. So instead of having discussions of Armageddon and our you know, water source, or saying, gosh, we're so divided, how are we ever gonna get it together? Uh, there was this trellis, this opportunity for people to find one another and to experience that interweaving and interdependence and that excitement and celebration of, of where they are. So I came up with these categories in my mind of what helps to create, what are those mechanisms, what is that trellis? And um, there are spaces that are conducive, certain kinds of spaces that are conducive to creating, helping to create networks of acquaintances. There's a certain feel, there's a certain kind of barista even, you know, um, uh, certain kinds of things like dog runs, spaces that are conducive. Then there's projects that are based on the identity of your beloved town. And um, I was talking about this with someone, I think he was from Burlington, Iowa, and he was hopping from one foot to the other. He was saying, you're right, yes, yes, that's what I'm doing, that's what I'm doing. There, you know, you look at your history, your waterfront, your, your food, your regional food, your regional culture, how are you inviting in other cultures and your natural be beauty. You look at these projects and, and you're automatically in a more proximal relationship than partisan relationship. Uh, you know, that, that where you're accentuating all your differences. And the last thing is something I call translation, which is, which is how we um, announce ourselves to the world, personally and as a town. How do we create that welcome to the world? What are our signs? What are our media? What are we saying to, to help flow and create points of access for people? So that became... So th what I love about being here is that I asked Liza, wh what is the sort of common ground? She, and she said, well, it's people who really appreciate and love everything about the built environment. And so, so when I think of this trellis, I think of people like you who, who appreciate what are those mechanisms? What are these, these ways that we can facilitate 
these relationships of positive proximity. And also, by the way, my dress is, is meant to represent the built environment. I, I, said, I felt like it really had different elements that... <laughs> Thank you. And, and that actually includes uh, some, some infrastructure within <laughs> to make it work. So um, anyway, so I had a few ideas that I came up with, kind of the way Kennedy was showing these, that wonderful variety of, of cool things, something that I learned. Uh, okay, so here are my ideas. Second room for, um, a, for cafes, especially in places where they're kind of having a hard time filling that space. There's this kind of dingy back room. You turn that into the second room. The first room is where people sit for 20 minutes and hang out. And you know, then they get the stink eye and they have to go. The second room is where the depressed teenager can hang out, and where you can have a meeting of a few people, and maybe even a poetry reading. You know, it's where things can really heat up in terms of communication and a sense of belonging and a place to go. Um, another thing I've really actively recommended is a disco ball uh, in every state house. Uh, uh, there's something called uh, um, capitalitis, and it's very serious, and it's a word that I made up. <laughs> um, there, and, and really, um, a uh, the, the disco ball is actually also a shorthand for any kind of um, municipal space, um, county seats, places like that. I, I'm always looking. There was one place in Pennsylvania I saw. It's a beautiful courthouse, a beautiful train station, and a really happening Chinese restaurant, and you knew exactly you know, what was, and everything else was really falling apart. So you knew exactly where those, you know, men and women went for lunch. You knew exactly what train station they got on to, to go home. And, and this big property and this big building. And some state houses are only uh, populated, as it were, for three months of the year um, by their legislators. So no restaurant wants to go near them. The properties are huge. You have to mow them. Where's the dog run? Where's the Todd Park? Where's, you know, what you have now are, are syringes and beer cans. Uh, so disco ball, just more partying down in the state houses. They are the temples of democracy. We own them. So we should be partying in them on a regular basis. So <laughs> that's Okay, I don't know if this is some, done specifically by people who are here, but the new maps of downtowns are so wonderful. And I, I, maybe it's as a visitor, but I think I would love to see them in my town. Those maps that are more than maps, they give some history, they give some illustrations, they give a little, in Rochester, uh, New York, they had flora and fauna. I love that stuff. And it also speaks of a certain pride, like, oh yeah, we're not just history, we are histories. We are, you know, we are uh, prehistory. We are Native American. We are colonial. We are mid-century modern. These, these, that kind of signage that kind of shows an illustrated history is is very inviting, very warm, and I and I believe building of positive proximity within communities as well. And the last thing I've, I've I have a lot of thoughts, but one another one was is senior centers being close to downtowns, not being two miles away. When I went to Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, and also Staunton, Wisconsin, there were constant references. You know, I interviewed people in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. There were constant references to the, the retired citizens who were the fuel, the gold, the consistent energy uh, and, and uh, engine of local projects. Their senior center is two blocks from downtown. And of course, I would advocate, as probably many people here would, that you would have a, a mixed use. So it's senior center and other things so that we really, you know, Girl Scouts, you know, really benefit from seniors who actually know how to build birdhouses because the next generation down, well, I would benefit from learning how to build a birdhouse. So maybe I would frequent that space as well. So those are some ideas I have for how these, uh, these projects uh, and how you know th these categories, we can we can fill them with things that build positive proximity. Um, I okay so so and that is my <laughs> that's my pitch <laughs> my pitch to urban planners is that that somehow part of part of how they're thinking as they come into space is how to uh, facilitate the mechanisms of 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 building these conversations where these guys will come out from out of the woods and volunteer their time and do things, you know, get people, shy people, 
to say, oh, I, I, can, make a, I can make a poster uh, for that, you know, after school musical theater program. Yes, I can. And then, you know, sometimes those people who are kind of like this and like I can make a poster, they become city council members and sometimes they become the mayor. So what are the things that invite them into the public square to begin with? That said, I feel <laughs> like, and Kennedy and I were talking about this, it's one thing to go into a place where you have a blank canvas, a beautiful idea and a blank canvas, and you just put it down and you bestow it upon the community. Unfortunately, when you're creating either the hardware, you know, the street lights, the street signs, the sidewalks, or the software, the, the facilitating of communication, through, you know, in what you're offering as planners, you have to deal with these entities called people. And uh, I have to meet people a lot in my job and I interviewed a lot of people, I, and I interviewed a lot of local government folks. So, I get it. I, I made a list of things that you might encounter. So, pugnacious, defensive, really defensive, uh, flaky, and not too bright. Uh, so, there are people that you're gonna have to, to deal with, and, I, and I, you have my sympathies, but I hope that you can Get in there. So I have some thoughts. One is flattery <laughs> and witnessing, you know, what's already there. Um, another is, uh, oh, is to find what I call conscious bridgers, the people who enjoy this idea that new energy and new bridges are going to come in, and they have great ideas. So the people to look for, if you're, if you're nervous or if something's not quite working, very funky librarian. Uh, librarians are, let's just say, the sexy librarian. It's a true thing. Uh, they, 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 they are, their minds alone, they're very creative thinkers. Uh, uh, very interesting middle school and high school science teachers are often a good place to look for this. And then city council members who either, who either bike to work and or wear uh, Halloween costumes annually. So just look for those people to begin with, like start there. Uh, I'm not saying that you're not going to find like something within the, the postal community. I, there's a lot of a lot of places to go, but but I would definitely, you know, ministry with the funny signs. It's worth it. And and I will just say, lastly on that one, also just value what you're bringing to these communities. I am a person who has benefited and seen the building up of of what the, you know these incremental plans have been um, the towns where when towns are returning from sprawl culture car culture mall culture all of those things and, and putting life into their downtowns they are aided by people like Jeff who talk about like nah cul-de-sac yeah we thought cul-de-sacs were cool but this is how they get divorced from any downtown engagement so they kind of create little you know hamster trails, but they don't connect to any, you know, all of that urban planning has been very, very valuable for helping people find their way back into their downtowns and finding each other. Um, as one guy in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania uh, said to me, he, he said, I said, what, what's, your, what's your secret? And he said, oh, I just work and work and work and I fight and I fight. He said, stay the course, don't burn bridges, never expect credit. <laughs> and to that I would add, sometimes you're going to burn bridges. Um, and it's okay, build them back. There are people out there who love it when we build bridges, uh, when, we, when we burn bridges, and they will, they will help us burn them. It, you can rebuild bridges. Um, so, so that's something I wanna say. And, and another thing about why I think it's so important uh, what people are doing when they come to, to help communities plan themselves, reflect and build, you know, build the good, um, is this, that is what people really want right now. They are asking a lot of their communities. I have done, I went on this book reading tour and, you know, people weren't just, you know, I was, I was there to celebrate things that I call like two, two story commerce. You have the retailers on one floor and then you have, and then you have, you know, CPAs and therapists and stuff on the second floor. And I love what, what Kennedy says about getting more different kinds of businesses in the retail spaces, too. But, you know, I was there to celebrate what was going on with food cultures and beer cultures and history. And, and you know, there I was in the Finger Lakes, and this woman raises her hand, and she's wearing, you know, a third-hand flannel shirt. Uh, and she said, what about poverty? There are people who are... Uh, you know, starving out there. I mean, obviously, I am very wealthy, and uh, I can eat. So what are we going to do for our neighbors? And, you know, I'll go down to, to um, Malaprops in Asheville, 
let's say, a, a beautiful bookstore, and we'll just, you know, sit and steep in the beauty of this successful, long-term, you know, long-running bookstore and all of the life and all of the things that are happening in Asheville, North Carolina, people say, yeah, but we really want to talk about racial justice. Something is broken, and we want to be part of the world that's fixing it. And we want to know how your talk about local communities is addressing those macro issues. And, um, and I'm very impressed with that. And all I can say is that once you have that conversation going, where you have those bridges, where you have that bridging social, uh, social capital, you have positive proximity, Okay, idealistically, I see you looking, us looking at the perimeter of this place to which we feel belong, we belong, and we say, those traditional fishermen who create excellent, you know, chowder at our, at our farmer's market, how are we going to you know, hold on to their traditional fishing places? That person, you know, we're watching that stretch of road kind of on the periphery of our town, and we're noticing that some people get stopped and some people don't, and we're seeing a, a profile. What are we going to do? Because that's our community. I'm seeing people, you know, in places that are becoming more busy, more affluent, you know, more interesting, more improved. I'm noticing in those places, community health centers, places where they're allocating some of that energy and that juju and that excitement to things that are more shared resources for people of lower incomes. I'm watching that happen. And that said, my, I had a babysitter, and you know, you're just never cool enough for your babysitters. And, and she, I told her the book I was writing, and she goes, oh, you're writing about gentrification. I was like, it's like not according to Jeff Speck, I'm not. Because uh, Jeff said something really, in, uh, well, Suburban Nation talks about something really interesting, which is there is improving our communities. The economy of, of drug deals on every corner, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing, we are having viable local economies that aren't based on shadow economies. So, so that's an exciting improvement. Um, but people are understandably concerned about this thing that they call gentrification. Uh, and I call it displacement. Displacement of soul, you know, the, the sense of who you are, and it's displacement, obviously, of, of, our, of, of, our, of the people who usually helped create that, that wonderful improvement. Um, there are so many people out here who are creating grape shot um, solutions to housing affordability and, um, and then talking to each other and cross-pollinating stuff about creating more uh, supply than demand, certain allocated amounts of, of housing for, um, well, you know, you know f for affordable housing, locating affordable housing better. It, it's really, everyone's thinking about it. Everyone cares. They really do. And we can all care more, I, I, would, I would say, submit. But uh, one thing I've discovered is that, I, okay, I was in Colorado Springs, perfect example. Colorado Springs is very cool. It has a beautiful regional theater company. It's got artists who, you know, they joke that people go down and buy art in Santa Fe, and it's always made by people who painted it in Col Colorado Springs. And, you know, they're really into... Uh, they're really feeling everything right now, but they're talking about how to get more people in the downtown. They still see themselves in that, you know, getting the energy going phase. And they're, very, they're having some um, envy issues with Fort Collins, because Fort Collins has all that beer uh, and, and a beer economy, and, and it is beautiful and really happening, and they have planters filled with gorgeous flowers. I mean, I, I understand where Colorado Springs is coming from, but if they can understand at this moment with their fabulous downtown uh, planning association uh, who took me out to lunch and are looking at the arts and housing and all this, that they have something right now. That, that is a good moment before the people come in from the outside and, and basically come in and create um, an economy and, and a lot of structures in their own profit motives image. So sometimes it just takes understanding what a special thing you've got, even if you don't think you're quite there yet. Um, but another thing I would, I, that I found is um, that people are very you know, critical of their downtowns. And I just want to sing a verse of a song. It's so depressing. You don't e I can't even sing the whole thing. But we were at a place in the mid-90s when I first started touring. When 
when I just was running through one boarded up town after another. And so we talk about these downtowns that have been taken over by precious silly things. Well, what's, what was our option really? Because all of these malls were offering, you know, this much aspirin for $2 and, uh, you know, 24 packs of tube socks. So the downtowns couldn't do that anymore. And um, so this is my, this is my witness. This is called Bought and Sold. Well, we're heading for a past that you can leave and not defend. Where the downtowns all the sadness of you can't go back again. It's there you'll find the rusting debtors motel signs with missing letters. Cause there's a monster on the outskirts says it knows what your town needs. Then it eats it up like nothing and it won't spit out the seeds. And we can be the super shoppers, we can say we're really smart. We can say our town is doing fine without a beating heart. We can even say the money saved is all our own, it's bought and sold, it's bought and sold. It's, it just gets worse. All right, so there we go. And Thank you. So I um, just want to make sure that I, yeah, I mentioned, yeah, okay, good, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. Uh, and okay, I think that uh, all I want to say is that um, I, I think that's about it, because what I, all, all I want to say is that positive proximity and what it is creating in downtowns right now to address some of our deepest concerns about what it is to be in a democracy are creating living democracies, are creating situations where instead of, you know, having to sit around and say, we're so divided, we never get along, why can't we just put aside our, you know, what, what our television sets are telling us to say. We are seeing examples, positive proximity in my, you know, the, the social, bridging social capital that is growing across this country is creating all of this wonderful, variegated, interwoven, uh, you know, vegetation. Well, you know what I mean, it's not vegetation, it's community. So, uh, and, and, we, and we share in the goodness of it, and we welcome the world because we recognize how that interweaving is, is what makes us wonderful, and it, we are less xenophobic for it. I really believe in the 21st century we're experiencing what I call a hometown pride with a worldly welcome. And, and that is an exciting thing to be modeling for one another uh, going forward. And as Kennedy was saying, oh, first of all, also Kennedy says something. She was talking about just how s towns and cities, there was this one town she went to where their biggest challenge is their low self-esteem. And I was like, that is totally a thing. That is a thing. And she goes, I they have history. They have cool people. They're beautifully located. They have everything. But they're so obsessed with the flooding behind their city hall and their summer traffic. And I was like, I know. It's just like a person. Like, they get all hung up on their ankles. And, and really, you know, like, but you're so cool. And so, so that's the other thing. Positive proximity is allowing people to reflect and say, we done good. And, and the last thing it does is that it counters that narrative of division that narrative of you're so divided, you're a bunch of morons, look how you don't get anything done. Does that remind you of anybody's tweets? The thing about that, it is a, it is a bottle of poison. It is a bottle of poison that you pour on all of those vines and can really kill them unless they're very strong and they're very connected. And then they throw away that trellis. And then they come in from the outside and tell you what you're going to look like and they profit. And, and I'm, 
I don't mean to go into a real us them thing, but it happened in our town. And so our town, which is filled with Peabody award-winning journalists and, and people who've won Pulitzers and hippie folk singers and really interesting people who moved to our town because they had more time than money and wanted to pour their hearts into this community. We were told by our local newspaper uh, that we were so divided we were a bunch of morons and, and there was a whole source to that uh, that really ultimately helped a developer create a, a development with absolutely no standard of, of operation. And um, right now, the, the owner has left, uh, the development is stalled. However, that feeling of division means that we really need new garbage cans. Uh, we have 100,000 people coming through our towns to use our hiking trails every year. We can't get it together to get the garbage cans. And no philanthropist from in, around our pretty affluent town has come in and said, hey, why don't I get you one of those solar compacting things? So we have this emblem of this narrative of division that we've believed because we are not divided. We are actually quite interwoven uh, that we are that, that we are having to live through. So, so what's wonderful is that when you have positive proximity, you can turn around to that whole narrative of division and people saying, you're a bunch of morons, you never get anything done. And you can say, this is a living democracy. And I'm not aiming for unity here because the opposite of division is not unity, it is collaboration. And we are collaborating. And we love living here. We find ourselves getting along. We love it here. Our children love it here. And we are really thinking that you would like to live here too. <laughs> so I'm going to finish with a song that I wrote as a sort of a cheerleading song for a city that's very busy. But I was really hoping that it would feel its history and feel all of the things, all of the points of access and, and welcome it had created for the world. And to hold on to that identity. I wrote this song for New York City. I want to thank you so much for having me here. I've already met some people here, and it's just, it's, I'm, I'm so grateful for the way that you have uh, participated in helping build back our towns and cities. I wouldn't have a career without you, but also <laughs> I might not have as much hope in what democracy can be. Thank you very much. They'll say they came to find this They'll tell their children of the day That as they walked Their tailor's chalk would trace the air There were peeling walls and darkened halls Hot and smoky night and yes, they strut, but when their boat arrived, the statue raised her light. And New York is a harbor. The dreamers work with careless tales. Who you are will survive you. The pattern fades as city stands. It's New York, it's New York, it's New York. Today you felt the sorrow, you thought today you'd pack it in. And overhead, the billboard said, we told you so. Poor were gone or jailed at dawn. The rubber barons free. They stole the art. Yeah, they broke your heart. So much for that liberty. And New York is a harbor. They're working hard on West 74th to find some beds. A free lawyer, the midnight oil burns like a torch. It's New York, it's New York, it's New York. 
And we cheer for the Harlock Joe on payday. The dancing girl when she gets to Broadway. The workers lunch on a crossbeam in the sky. So don't you let yourself forget A spirit lives on the island She's floating past the Roblings Bridge And in the dark Through Olmsted's Park To Harlem's Gate Before Some souls were born on golden horns but she can hear them still in some last call she's been as Stonewall in to beat the morning's chill. And New York is a harbor. It was so then and evermore. It holds a dream, it tells a story. A distant boat, a golden door It's New York, it's New York Thank you again. Thank you. One more round of applause for Dar Williams. I think the party's in the parking lot, right? See you there. <laughs>